Super. Then, so my name is Soha Youssef and I'm convening the seminar uh, series on behalf of UNU Merit and Maastricht University in the Netherlands. The migration seminar series invites researchers, practitioners, policymakers, and others to discuss their work related uh, to migration. Before I will introduce today's speaker, there's some housekeeping that I'd like to uh, introduce you to. Uh, so our speaker's talk will last approximately 40 minutes, after which we'll have 20 minutes for discussion and questions from the audience. I'd like to ask you to keep your questions until after our speaker is done uh, with uh, her presentation. You can then either put the question in the chat so I can then read it out loud for you, or you can use the raise uh, the hand uh, function uh, and then I will allocate turns. Uh, please, in the meantime, keep your microphones muted. Your camera can be turned on if you would like to, but please be aware that we are recording the seminar uh, for distribution via our YouTube channel later. On our, on our YouTube channel, you can also find recordings of previous migration seminars in the past years. Then now let me introduce you to our speaker. Uh, so we're very, uh, very happy to welcome Gulay back to our uh, seminar uh, series. Gulay Turkman is a so sociologist and an, an independent researcher. Her work examines how macro scale historical, cultural and political developments inform questions of belonging and identity formation in multicultural societies. Her research interests stand in the intersection of politics and religion as they relate to questions of identity, migration, uh, diversity, pluralism, and citizenship. She is the author of Under uh, the Banner of Islam, Turks, Kurds, and the Limits of Religious Unity. She has published in several academic outlets, including the Annual Review of Sociology, Qualitative Sociology, Soci Sociological Qu Quarterly, Nations and Nationalism, and the New Diversities. And with that said, let me give the floor to Gulay. Gulay, all yours. Thank you so much, Soha. Um, it's great to be back here. Um, so, uh, and thanks everyone for attending. Um, what I will be presenting today is an article um, that I've recently completed and it's forthcoming in the journal Ethnic and Racial Studies. And when I uh, offered to present this at this um, colloquium, it was still under review. So I was hoping that maybe I could implement some of the feedback that I get uh, from this presentation into the article that will unfortunately no longer be possible, but I would still very much like to welcome comments and questions. Um, and um, hopefully I can integrate them in the um, in future articles that will come out, like uh, follow-up articles. Um, so this uh, this uh, uh, presentation is titled, it, I changed the uh, title a little bit, it's uh, now a bit longer, um, it's titled Categorical Astigmatism on Ethnicity, Religion, Nationality and Class in the Study of Migrants in Europe. And it takes as its focus the conflation of uh, categories in the study of migrants in Europe, and it offers intersectionality as a way out. And while doing so, I employ a theoretical framework built on Bourdieu's theory of classification struggles, and I coined the concept categorical astigmatism. So this is a bit of a, a theoretical article. I will be also sharing like empirical interview data, but it will mostly cover um, theoretical uh, background and theoretical framework. Um, just so you know, before listening. Okay, so the study of migrants in Europe has become characterized by an intensifying emphasis on identity politics. For a long time, methodological nationalism was the norm, and this made national identity the most popular lens for studying migrants to the detriment of ethnicity. For example, migrants from Turkey who arrived in various European countries in the 1960s and 1970s were labeled as Turkish workers, despite the existence of a sizable Kurdish population among them. And the conflation of ethnicity and nationality was to change shape when a turn toward religious identities took place. Arguably commencing with the Rushdie affair, Muslims as a distinct category gained popularity in media and political discourse. And over time, especially after 9-11, Muslim identity has been increasingly racialized. 
With this shift, migrants and minorities, groups that are not seen as natives or autochthons, who were previously categorized according to their nationality and or ethnicity, began to be categorized according to their religious identity instead. And what resulted was a cacophony of categories where religion, ethnicity, and nationality were used interchangeably at times and got conflated at other times. Boundaries between categories became blurred and migrants found themselves lumped into categories they would not primarily or necessarily identify with. While the main culprits behind this categorical cacophony are politicians and the media, Social scientists have also contributed to this problem by reproducing the non-reflexive use of categories in their writing. I intervene in this debate by conceptualizing categorical astigmatism to refer to situations where the tendency to conflate categories and lump migrants in categories they might not identify with ends up blurring our vision of them. Such an indiscriminate lens, I argue, ignores the complexity of internal diversity among these groups flattens out their multiple identities, and simplifies their context-dependent identity formation processes. It also risks a misrepresentation of their life experiences. And I go on to suggest that the prioritization of ethnic, national, or religious identities has had a second but equally important outcome. Despite its importance in the lived experiences of migrants, class has been brushed aside as a non-category, and reserved only for economic discussions around labor migration. As such, intra-ethnic, intra-religious class differences and their impact on the dynamics between and among migrants have not gotten enough attention. While class is not absent in the literature on migration, class differences among migrants and their intersection with ethnicity and religion is usually left undiscussed. And I suggest that an intersectional approach could make up for this shortcoming and provide a way out of categorical astigmatism. Empirically, I analyze this topic through a focus on migrant minorities from Turkey and Syria in Germany. In reiterating the play for categorical clarification, I make use of Bourdieu's theory of classification struggles. As put by Jenkins, and I quote, all human knowledge is dependent upon classification, end quote. And at the heart of classification lies identification. Social actors deploy two ideal typical modes of identification, self or group identification, which is internally oriented, and categorization of others, which is externally oriented. Because the self-identity of groups might not overlap with externally assigned categories, this dialectic process is often full of contestation and power struggles among various actors. The power struggles central to categorization constitute the main theme of Bourdieu's theory of classification struggles. According to Bourdieu, classification in social sciences is different than it is in natural sciences. The social scientist has to deal with an a priori classified social world. Moreover, unlike in the natural sciences, the objects of analysis in social sciences can contest scientists' classifications. Thus, it's imperative that social scientists reflexively question the categories they deploy in analyzing the social world. And classificatory struggles are ultimately about symbolic power, which denotes the power to establish the taken for granted categories in classifying social collectivities and constructing social hierarchies. Symbolic power is often accompanied by symbolic violence, which ensures that individuals accept the world as it is and find it natural. In Bourdieu's theory, the state is often the main actor to exercise symbolic violence. In this sense, the state acts as the ultimate classifier, holding the monopoly of the legitimate viewpoint. Yet, other actors might resist the state's classificatory categories, giving birth to what Bourdieu terms classification struggles. Despite the state's role as the ultimate classifier, the naturalization of classificatory schemas also involves mediating actors, among whom are social scientists. Mediating actors do not always resist, but sometimes reproduce classifications. For example, in distinction, Bourdieu criticizes social certification scholars not only for non-reflexively employing a priori categories, but also for being oblivious to the fact that certification research is actively engaged in the formation and establishment of the class hierarchies that it describes. As such, scholars who are analysts of naturalizers also act as analytic naturalizers. Bourdieu's theory has equipped scholars with the opportunity to critically approach classifications in migration research, where contestation over categorization and labeling is widespread. 
In discussing the politics of naming and the state's power to classify, scholars have problematized the dichotomies of refugee versus migrant, migrant versus asylum seeker, expat versus migrant, and some have questioned the categories of migration background, migrant descendant, immigrant origin, and second generation. Others have highlighted the difficulty of measuring ethnic, religious, and racial identities. And via a scrutiny of parliamentary debates, censuses, statistical registers, and official categories of migration and integration, they have criticized the way migrant and minority populations are conceptualized and quantified in Europe. And Bourdieu's influence has been most visible in works on the scholarly power to reclassify and reify problematizing how scholars have contributed to the process through which populations of immigrant origin have been transformed into Muslims, Rogers Brubaker asked scholars to refrain from non-reflexively using pre-constructed categories of journalistic, political, or religious common sense as their categories of analyses. And he has this famous article from 2013 titled Categories of Practice versus Categories of Analyses. Um, and similarly, the Hindan distinguishes between common sense categories of politics and analytical categories of research and suggests that the conflation of these categories is a central way in which researchers reproduce normalized migration and ethnic difference. And Brubaker and the Hindan's work build on an earlier strand of research bridging migration studies with the literature on symbolic boundaries criticizing the tendency to use ethnic and national identities as taken for granted units of analysis, these works have highlighted the constructed nature of ethnic and national boundaries and paved the way for alternative approaches to studying identity formation among minority and migrant groups. In their attempt to go beyond nationality and ethnicity, scholars have called for the denaturalization, demigrantization, and denationalization of migration research. And to that aim, they've highlighted local and transnational forms of belonging with an emphasis on cities and transnational religious communities, especially on transnational Muslim communities in Europe. The emphasis on transnational Muslim belonging, coupled with the increased scholarly attention to Islam, has resulted in methodological Islamism, a tendency to treat Muslim as a master status and the continuously salient self-identification. Because European identity still remains embedded in Christianity, Muslims have emerged as the ultimate other in political, public, and scholarly debates. And such a shift from ethnicization to Islamization of migrants has intensified what Beck calls categorical dissonance, a condition where the self-understanding of social actors, the scientific observers' perspectives, and the routine workings of social institutions are no longer aligned. I conceptualize this misalignment in migration research as categorical astigmatism, as it blurs scholars' analyses of migrant minorities and overlooks the super diversity among them. Categorical astigmatism occurs when scholars uncritically reproduce taken for granted categories, use them interchangeably at times, and conflate them at other times, which intensifies the dissonance between self defined social identities and other attributed categorizations. As astigmatism and imperfection in the curvature of the eye makes things blurry at every distance, categorical astigmatism blurs scholars' vision, preventing them from seeing their objects of analysis clearly. Resultantly, scholarly analyses suffer from the mixing up of different identity categories, for example, ethnic, religious, racial, and national identities, and an overemphasis on certain categories, like religion, to the detriment of others, like class. The roots of categorical astigmatism and the conflation of identity markers can be traced back to the use of ethnicity, especially in the US in the 1950s, to refer to nearly any minority group, be they religious, linguistic, or otherwise. The association of ethnicity with religion on the one hand and with immigrant groups on the other hand has turned race, language, religion, and national origin all into possible markers of ethnicity, which has aggravated the terminological confusion in the literature paving the way for categorical astigmatism. Scholarly attempts to deal with categorical astigmatism have mainly focused on the knottedness of these categories, yet few have recognized the fuzziness that results from the tendency to collapse them. These categories are indeed entwined, but equally important is that their conflation makes sharp analytical lenses difficult in the study of migrant minorities. We may have no good alternative to using analytical categories that are heavily loaded and deeply contested categories of practice, suggests Brubaker. 
However, as I argue in the remainder of this uh, presentation, there is the possibility of both sharpness and the recognition of categorical entanglement via the deployment of not only new methodological advances, but also intersectionality theory. I exemplify categorical astigmatism via the study of immigrants from Turkey and Syria in Germany. And quotes I will share with you come from 38 in-depth semi-structured open-ended qualitative interviews I conducted for two of my former research projects between 2016 and 2019. While one project focused on the increasing diversity among self-identified Muslim immigrants in Germany, the other one focused on how the new wave of highly skilled migrants from Turkey cope with ethnic stereotyping in Germany. And in both cases, purposive and snowball sampling were used and the interviews focus on the respondents' migration history, their socioeconomic background and how it impacts their social networks, how they self-identify, um, their everyday experiences as immigrants from Muslim majority countries, how they handle the ethnic and religious stereotyping and discrimination, if any, they face and their relationships with uh, native Germans and members of each other's communities and members of their own communities. So migrants from Syria and Turkey in Germany are characterized by high levels of internal diversity, as I said, which gets concealed by categorical astigmatism. For example, as I said in the introduction, scholars often treat country of or origin as a synonym for ethnicity and conflate national identity with ethnicity. This was all too clear in an interview I conducted with a 26 year old Kurdish asylum seeker from Turkey who resided at the time in Berlin. He had to flee Turkey because of his ties to the outlawed Kurdistan Workers Party, PKK. And in response to whether he ever received the comment, but you don't look Turkish in Germany, he said, I received that comment sometimes and I respond that it's because I'm not Turkish, but Kurdish. This confuses them even more, but it gives me the opportunity to explain the difference between my nationality and my ethnicity. As a Kurd in exile, I want nothing to do with Turks and Turkishness. Plus, phenotypical features are not helpful in these discussions. I, an ethnic Kurd, might look Turkish, but you, an ethnic Turk, could easily be taken for a Kurdish Alevi from Sivas, a city in central Anatolia, for example. I think we also look Spanish. I mean, it's hard to tell. Yet another example of categorical astigmatism is when migrants from Turkey and Syria in Germany are categorized first and foremost as Muslims, obscuring the existence of non-believers and non-Muslims among them. In an interview I conducted with a young Druze Sunni couple from Syria, the Druze man told me that he's automatically assumed to be Muslim when he tells people that he's from Syria. As a member of a little known religious group, I'm used to people not knowing about the Druze, yet, what surprises me is the lack of knowledge here in Germany about the existence of Christians in Syria. Although Christians constituted about 8 to 10% of the overall population in pre-war Syria, most people I have met here still assume that Syrians are all Muslims. The Islamization of these communities also lumps those embracing Muslim as a cultural identity with those embracing it as a religious identity. Such a tendency marks cultural religion or the right to belong without believing as a uniquely Western and Christian phenomenon. However, my interviews display that culturalized religion is also existent among migrants from Turkey and Syria. Although I no longer fast or pray, I still celebrate the Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha, the two official Muslim holidays, said Maya, who left Syria in the summer of 2015. I love preparing big tables and inviting friends over. It reminds me of my childhood, where we celebrated the Eid together with my extended family at my grandparents' place. Or consider Hakan, a middle-aged migrant from Turkey who moved to Germany in 2013. I'm not sure if I can be considered a Muslim. I still fast from time to time, but I also drink alcohol during Ramadan when I'm not fasting, and I eat pork. This usually confuses my German friends, and it's enough reason for devout Muslims to see me as an apostate. Honestly, I do not care too much. After all, this is between me and God, and I believe that it's all about good intentions. So Hakan's definition of his faith is reminiscent of what Robert Bella calls Shailism in the American context, this idea that religion is essentially a private matter. In the same way, classifying German nationals of Turkish descent as Germans or Turks for that matter, 
unless they opt to be defined as such, conceals the limits of citizenship, the intricacies of naturalization, and the importance naturalized German citizens of Turkish descent might attach to their ethnicity. In their study with German Muslims of Turkish descent, Holtz et al. demonstrate that most participants find the categories German or Turkish inadequate in defining their identities and prefer to be classified as German Turks, Deutsch Türken, instead. Such nuances and migrant minorities' heterogeneity all get blurred when a categorical astigmatic lens is employed in analyzing these communities. So what can be done? How can scholars move past categorical astigmatism? One solution to overcome categorical astigmatism is to implement the methodological advances put forward by recent scholarship. One such suggestion has come from scholars who propose to employ social network analyses in order to overcome ethnicity bias. They argue that doing so would enable scholars to go beyond the ethnic, religious, and national lenses and emphasize human agency instead. Another proposal comes from Druho and Garib, who suggest using Latin class analyses to avoid racial essentialism and methodological nationalism in studying the heterogeneity of Asian Americans. In a separate paper, Drew criticizes quantitative scholars of continuing to rely on samples split by ethnically, racially, or religiously defined immigrant groups as the key categories of analysis. And he presents a novel quantitative methodology, namely the inductive subgroup comparison approach to translate these theoretical considerations for reflexivity and heterogeneity into empirical practice. Similarly, Schneider and Heath propose a new classification developed for the European Social Survey to remedy the conflation of ethnicity and national identity by measuring cultural or ethnic origins and by identifying both indigenous and subnational minorities as well as those with a migration background. I believe that in addition to methodological solutions, one theoretical remedy to categorical astigmatism lies in the theory of intersectionality. Positing that social markers of difference in a given society at a given time cannot be understood in isolation from one another, intersectionality draws attention to the importance of individual experiences that transcend social categorizations, such as nationality, gender, or race as standalone identifications. As such, an intersectional approach provides scholars with the necessary tools to showcase the heterogeneity of migrant minorities and the complexity of their lived experiences. And much has been written on intersectionality. Early proponents have displayed how people cannot be reduced to one category at a time. And criticizing early theories for their determinism, scholars have recently proposed to unsettle categories themselves. And they've also argued that intersecting identities work to produce particular structures, not only of inequality and exclusion, but also of opportunities and inclusion. For example, most migrant minorities in Europe encounter obstacles to cultural belonging. However, not all of them are deemed equal by the state and the public, while Muslims, Jews, and people of color are disproportionately discriminated against, the highly skilled among these groups still receive preferential treatment as they are considered not only essential to the economic development of European countries, but also more likely to belong. This brings me to my last point, the importance of class in the study of migrant minorities and its intersection with other markers of difference. So while there is no consensus on a precise definition of class, social scientists usually agree that it's ultimately about inequality and the unequal distribution of resources, be they economic and symbolic. Based on this view, usually three different uh, definitions are employed, Marxian, Weberian, or Bourdieuian definitions. At the center of Marxian class stands the production of surplus, exploitation, and the unequal distribution of economic resources, Weber talks about social classes and the unequal distribution of life chances as well as status originating from education, lineage, and lifestyle. And Bourdieu furthers Weber's definition by adding economic, social, cultural, and symbolic capital into the mix. He emphasizes the relational relationality of class and points to the dynamics between self-ascribed class position versus others' interpretation of an individual's class markers. Subscribing to the Bourdieuian conceptualization of class, I argue that the turn to identity politics in the study of migrant minorities in Europe has pushed aside class as a non-identity, reinforcing categorical astigmatism 
and the prioritization of ethnicity, nationality, and religious identity as essential markers of difference. This is not to suggest that class is absent in the study of migrants in Europe. To the contrary, works focusing on these communities usually feature class, especially because many migrants in Europe have originated as labor migrants. However, these works talk about class only in the context of economic debates, and more importantly, most of them do not analyze class in relation to other identities. It's only recently that intersectional analyses of class have emerged, demonstrating how it interacts with other markers of inequality to produce diverse experiences of transnational migration. Majority of these analyses assume migrant minorities in Europe to be working class, while natives are deemed to be middle or upper class. In this understanding, it becomes almost impossible to segregate culture from class. This is quite aptly expressed by Saskia Bonjour in a 2023 article in a candid self-critique of, of her 2018 article with Dui Wendak on the racialized intersections of class and culture in Dutch integration debates. And I quote Bonjour here, I think we did not push our conceptual thinking on this question hard enough at the time. All Western people were assumed to be middle class and all non-Western people were assumed to be lower class. Working class Dutch people were rendered wholly invisible in this discursive process, end quote. Along the same lines, Hunkler et al. highlight the homogenization of forced migrants as poor or classless. In the German context, this means that middle or upper class migrants from Turkey and Syria receive less scholarly attention while some intersectional analyses focus on how middle or upper class migrant minorities from Turkey cope with ethnic discrimination and marginalization in Germany, in Germany, they still don't go beyond the comparison of receiving population versus incomers. As a result, intra-migrant class differences and their impact on migrant minorities' identity formation end up being invisible. For example, in my interviews with recently arriving highly skilled migrants from Turkey in Germany, I found that this group of newcomers often employ the same negative classification native Germans employ towards earlier migrants from Turkey and their Germany-born descendants. Mehmet, a 48-year-old migrant from Turkey who moved to Germany in 2015, summarized these tensions as follows. When moving to Germany, my wife and I had decided that we would that we wouldn't be friend Turks in Germany, as we thought we would not get along with them. We used to employ the expression Almanji as a derogatory term to refer to those first generation migrants from Turkey in Germany, as well as to their children. Then, when we arrived in Germany, I realized how prejudiced we were against those Almanjus with a different socioeconomic profile than ours. I'm an engineer, and my wife is a dentist with a PhD. There is no way we can guess what that first generation of migrants from Turkey went through in this country. They were left alone by the governments of Turkey and Germany. Yes, some of our co-ethnics in Germany put us in a difficult situation, but I now feel only respect towards the first generation. Similarly, Ebru, a 32-year-old design engineer from Turkey who moved to Germany in 2017 said, I was not aware of my own discriminatory attitude towards the existing Turkish diaspora in Germany until one day an Israeli friend of mine here in Berlin drew my attention to it. Have you realized that when people ask you where you are from, you provide them with details such as where you were raised or which school you attended, she asked. It then hit me. Upon telling people that I'm from Turkey, I was indeed always following up with unasked for details. I'm from Turkey, but I was raised in Istanbul and I attended a French high school or I lived in other European countries before moving to Germany. So clearly I was subconsciously trying to locate myself apart from the Turkish community here. As demonstrated by these quotes, rather than ethnicity, nationality or religion, class characterized by a combination of symbolic and cultural capital was the brighter identity for Mehmet and Ebru. And note that these are anonymized names. Another recent migrant from Turkey, the 41-year-old Elif, brought the intersection of class with religion into the discussion. I never thought about my Turkishness when living in Turkey, but I was forced to think about it when I moved to Germany, where Turkishness is equated with Muslimness, which signals a different lifestyle than that of Germans. This image is also produced by the existing Turkish diaspora in Europe. When you don't fit that image, save for the language you speak, 
Your identity just doesn't overlap with theirs. I run a small hotel and I always get questioned by our customers as to why I wear a miniskirt or why I don't wear a headscarf. In short, why I look quote unquote modern. I'm also forced to prove to people that I'm not an AKP, Justice and Development Party supporter. All social and political polarizations in Turkey are reproduced here in Germany. I get along better with most Germans than I do with members of the Turkish diaspora. The main reason for this is that we share different political wheels, views. I don't want to be discriminatory, but we are clearly different. As these quotes display, some recently arriving highly skilled upper middle class migrants from Turkey end up reproducing the existing ethnic hierarchies in Germany, which positions those from Turkey at the lower end. They try to make up for their ethnic disadvantage by resorting to their class advantage with the hope that it would set them apart from other Turks and position them closer to native Germans. However, such repositioning does not prevent them from ending up at the impermeable borders of the national culture. Because social identities are also dependent on recognition, no matter how much they prioritize their class identity and position themselves as cosmopolitan transnational individuals, they are not accepted as full members of the receiving society. They then end up experiencing the integration paradox. Surveys conducted in both Germany and the Netherlands with highly skilled migrants from Turkey show that defying expectations, this group of migrants report low levels of national belonging to these countries. Similarly, in an earlier project, I found that recently arriving highly skilled migrants from Turkey in Germany felt alienated from both countries, resulting in what Gertz et al. call non-belonging. An ethnic or religious lens or a methodological nationalist approach would fail to capture all these dynamics. It's only by an intersectional approach that we can come up with a more nuanced portrayal of the classification struggles, not only between natives and migrant minorities, but also within migrant minorities. So to conclude, um, as I've tried to show in this presentation, the cultural turn and the focus on identity politics in migration studies has had two important consequences. First, it has resulted, resulted in the essentialization of socially constructed context-dependent identity categories as the ultimate markers of difference. While scholars have discussed the essentialization of these categories under the titles methodological nationalism, methodological Islamism, and the ethnic lens, there has been no umbrella concept to refer to this phenomenon at large. With the help of a Bourdieuian framework, I contribute to this literature, hopefully, by conceptualizing categorical astigmatism, which occurs when actors and institutions with classifying power essentialize certain identity categories at times conflate them, and at others use them interchangeably, putting migrant minorities in categories they wouldn't necessarily prioritize or self-identify with. Such an attitude blurs our vision and analysis of these communities. As my interview data have demonstrated, um, categorical astigmatism influences these uh, migrants' uh, self-identities and also other identities. I've suggested that to move past categorical astigmatism, scholars can implement the already available methodological alternatives, such as social network analyses, latent class analyses, or the inductive subgroup comparison approach, as well as theoretical alternatives, such as intersectionality theory. And building on intersectionality theory's emphasis on the interaction of different identity categories, I've argued that the so second notable consequence of the turn to identity politics has been the brushing aside of class. Even when class made an appearance, it was not problematized since migrant minorities were classified as working class and native Europeans as middle or upper class. And via interviews with recently arriving highly skilled middle or upper middle class migrants from Turkey and Germany, I've demonstrated how such a deterministic portrayal contributes to categorical astigmatism by blinding scholars to intra-migrant class differences and the tensions between newcomers and long-established members of the diaspora. A class-oriented intersectional lens would help remedy these shortcomings and come up with clearer accounts of these communities, I propose. And a renewed attention to highly skilled migrants might also help overcome methodological nationalism and methodological Islamism by underlining transnational spaces of class. 
So this is not to claim that culture does not matter. For example, in a 2019 article, Rotman and Kaya showed that some Syrian refugees in Istanbul prefer to stay in Turkey rather than going to Europe because of the cultural and religious proximity between Turkey and Syria. And this is what the refugees say in their interviews. Similarly, a Syrian refugee I interviewed in Germany told me that she would have preferred to stay in Turkey if she was given the chance, but she had to leave after three years in Turkey as she had family members in Germany. In the same way, disappointment in Europe was a recurring pattern in my interviews with highly skilled migrants from Turkey. Referring to the discrimination they face in Germany, this is not what we expected was a shared comment, leading some to cling to their Turkishness as reactive ethnicity and others to embrace a more cosmopolitan identity. As the literature on effective citizenship displays, belonging is also about emotions and highly skilled migrants find it difficult to belong despite their structural similarities to highly skilled natives. And this is why, again, an intersectional lens is vital. In Turkey, for example, before the AKP came into power and turned religious lifestyle into a tool of upward mobility, a secular lifestyle was seen as a necessary but inadequate condition of upper class membership. The repercussions of this history can now be seen in the tensions between the newly arriving middle or upper class migrants mostly with urban secular backgrounds and those who arrived in Germany as working class migrants in the 1960s and 70s, mostly from rural conservative Anatolian towns. However, existing culturalist analyses fail to cover these nuances. Those scholarly analyses of the highly educated upper class descendants of working class migrants in Europe push the conceptual limits in the literature. They still subscribe to the migrant native dichotomy and they do not consider complicating the matter with an intra-migrant class comparison. As my analysis shows, it's time we've turned our faces to the nexus of multiple identity markers within migrant minority communities. Such an analytical shift highlighting intra-migrant dynamics would also further our understanding of claims-making processes of migrants in Europe and um, a, to a topic future scholarships shall investigate. So thanks so much for listening to me. I'm very much uh, looking forward to your comments and questions. Now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Gley. Let's open up the floor then. If you have a question, uh, you may raise uh, your hand using the function or drop it in the chat box. Uh, Melissa, please go ahead. Sure, I can at least jump in and, and get started. So thanks so much for, for that presentation. I think it actually um, lines up really well with some of the things we've been talking about in some of the migration courses this week. So I think that was actually a perfect timing. Um, there, I actually have a couple of questions for clarification first. Um, so when you were talking about what are some of the answers to deal with these challenges, you talked about what some of the other scholars have, uh, have discussed, and I didn't, I wasn't able to mark them all down, but you talked about latent class analysis and inductive subgroup comparison approach, mm -hmm. but I, it was not clear to me what those two approaches actually are. Could you mm -hmm. explain those a little bit more? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they are um, quantitative uh, methodologies that um, quantitative scholars came up with. And I give like a detail in the article about them, like I, I um, specifically like uh, explain them um, in the article, but I didn't have time to go no, over those uh, in the presentation. Um, so, um, and uh, another one was like social network analyses where uh, scholars suggest that we uh, look beyond um, ethnic and national and religious categories and start with, for example, networks um, so that the starting point would be like who these uh, migrants socialize with or, or what their networks are so that you can see um, to begin with, you don't start with a specific ethnic or national identity in mind. And the other, um, the latent class analyses and uh, the, oh, I, even I don't remember the second one, the uh, ICSA or something. Yeah, uh, the inter mostly, inductive subgroup comparison. Yeah, yeah so something. they are mostly 
um, than with like computational um, analyses, computational methodologies. Um, and again, uh, like with the social network analyses, they suggest starting not with um, not with uh, the given like ethnic, national, or religious um, categories, but um, look at the sample, like for example, survey samples, and uh, not start with the um, answers to this question of like where do you come from, um, and make other comparisons within the sample. So they go through, they create new categories um within the sample so that it would be like sub-national sub-ethnic categories and compare those um rather than comparing like ethnic or national differences could you just give an example of what that would what what something could be that would be such a sub-category um so like as i said with the network analyses you could um they look mainly at uh the socialization like they create these networks they ask these migrants with who they socialize with in um, in their uh, work life, but also in their social life, um, and then they start with those notes um, to cut uh, to to compare uh, these migrants, and um, that would be like I think one example of um, of a category that we could think of. Okay. It's hard for me to see how that's analytically super useful, mm -hmm. <laughs> but but I, I but I definitely take the point on the intersectionality being extremely important. Absolutely. All right. Thanks. I, I see other hands. Sibel. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? I'm in a, a in a in a a bit crowded area, so I'll just keep it short. Thank you so much for the presentation. And uh, my question is about how you define class, because in your presentation you also mentioned that class is mostly kind of uh, taken from the economic perspective. But I uh, kind of sense that you have similar definition as well, because you are talking about uh, upper class descendants of. Uh, working class migrants, but considering how one can become upper class, it's even not possible for a uh, uh, you know second or third generation migrants to become upper class in a migrant environment. So thinking class with all the you know uh, all the elements rather than economic. So that's why I'm a bit like confused in the way that how you take class, how you define class. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I mean, as I uh, said in the presentation, there are three uh, main definitions of class used in the um, in the literature, and I I had a slide on that, um, Marxian, Weberian, and Bourdieuian. And the way I define it is the Bourdieuian class. I I subscribe to that um, definition. Uh, which includes not only economic uh, resources but also um, symbolic and capital um, symbolic capital and cultural capital and um, in the um, in in my interviews when I uh, look at for example the um, when I say middle or upper class um, migrants from Turkey who are like newly arriving migrants um, it does not necessarily mean that they are economically um you know rich or um uh, they their families are rich or, or what have you but in terms of um symbolic and cultural capital um they are clearly different from um certain working class uh migrants so um in that sense that's how i'm using um class and with the uh with the upper class um descendants of migrant um, uh, migrant uh, working class migrants this is how that was used in the literature in the first place like when when these um there are a few studies look looking at the descendants of um, working class uh, migrants and um and they use um economy like uh, they use like uh, wages salary occupation um, as a, a marker of class um, and um, they specifically look at these um, 
these this group like this descendant uh these descendants of um working class migrants but i also agree with you that um they do not necessarily um get into like they do not necessarily um ascend into upper class because they have uh, better jobs or because they have uh, better salaries uh, or um, they they have uh, professions that are regarded as more like highly um, high, highly regarded in the uh, society um, so in that sense I think the um, categorization of them as upper class could also be problematized I did not look at them in my uh, own interviews um, but I agree with uh, with the supposition that it's not only um, economics or economic resources that uh, defines one's class. Okay, then, yeah, thank you for the clarification. I thought that that part is coming from your study, like upper class descendants of, yeah, then, then it makes sense now. Yeah, because that was the confusion that I had. Okay, thank you. Very much. Um, any more questions, clarifications, comments? Uh, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Sabla. Chala. Yeah, sorry. Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I uh, listened to the presentation as an actually uh, political interaction uh, to the literature and, and to the way in which uh, social sciences uh, analyze or work on migration and uh, that was I, I mean I don't have a question let me say this this is just a comment and I find this uh, political intervention really um, important and uh, as I was listening I, I felt like this is something that uh, that all social scientists when working on these categories and on these issues should be aware of their uh, of the characteristic of their work, which is actually political. <laughs> that was uh, what I uh, told during the presentation and what this article made me think. And I wanted to you know, thank you for that. I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I mean, it is uh, also political intervention. Um, and I am glad to hear that. Um, it also comes across as as that, you know, uh, that's how I kind of started to write this in the first place. I was frustrated myself uh, being an immigrant um, in Germany and experiencing this on a daily basis. Um, so it kind of like um, built on my academic um, expertise, but also my um, personal experiences. Um, so thanks a lot. Um, Chala, for that comment. <laughs> Any more questions or comments? Super. So with that said, thank you so much uh, once again for this wonderful uh, session. It's always lovely to have you with us here in the Migration Seminar. Uh, for the rest, uh, I'm about to announce the topic for next month. Uh, the speaker actually just emailed me and it is likely to be on integration policies and their impact. Uh, so for the students uh, out there here, uh, it's going to be super interesting for you. And for the rest, I'm sure it will also be interesting for you. Keep an eye on our uh, events page on UNU Merit. And if you would like to get a copy of this recording, you will find it very soon on our YouTube channel. Thank you very much uh, again, and I hope to see you in the next uh, seminar. Thank you so much again. So much again. Thank you. And thanks for listening to me. Thank you, Gulay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.